Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, it's, I always like it when we have a little bit of a smaller group because we're going to be a little bit more interactive a bowl, I guess, is a good way to say it. So if I ask a question or if I ask you to raise your hand, please feel free. Don't be inhibited. We're going to talk through some, some basic things today about the immune system. And then we're also going to talk specifically about the flu, the flu virus, and the common cold and the differences between those and some things that we can do to both prevent those things and um, to treat them um, if necessary. So let's dive into the immune system, shall we? So first of all, what does the immune system do? I mean, we talk a lot about the immune system and we, we think about it kind of vaguely and we hear words like white blood cells and we, um, we think about getting a fever or we think about what are some of the things we think about when we think of the immune system? Anybody? What kind of comes to your mind? Like when it fails maybe? What comes to your mind when you're thinking about a failure of the immune system? Right, sickness, disease, specifically maybe more acute diseases, right? Things that are more transient, that come and go, right? As opposed to chronic diseases, although the immune system is very involved in chronic disease as well, um, as we know. But at the very basics, what it does is it fights infectious disease. Now, when we talk about the immune system in our bodies, uh, a lot of times we use very militaristic terms like fight, fighting and warring and invaders and battling, right? And the reason for that is because uh, our immune system, it really is a war, okay? We have our cells in our body within this environment of many other organisms. We have allies, right? Our healthy bacteria that live in and on us, right? Th things like that. We talk about probiotics when we talk about the immune system and immune health. So we have those allies. We have a couple other allies that we're going to talk about specifically, but the rest of it is kind of trying to take us over, really. The, the, the immune or the organisms around us, viruses, bacteria, those kind of things that we're going to go through, are really trying to uh, hijack our body and use it for their own purposes. So that's why we talk a lot about um, the immune system with those kind of military terms. It really is a war. So who are the main players? Well, we talk about white blood cells. There's a lot of different kinds of these. There's a couple listed here. We've got neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils. If you ever get blood work drawn, um, you may see some of these names, right? Percentages of these names when you get a, a CBC, perhaps. Um, anybody remem remember seeing some of those words there as far as percentages go? If you ever take a look at your blood work, you can see that. And there's certain ranges of what, what kind you're supposed to have and in what amount as well. Um, but we look at these guys kind of as a whole as some main players in our immune system. We have mast cells over there, I think, lymphocytes. Platelets are also part of the immune system. Anybody tell me what a platelet does? Platelets. You know this, I know you do. Has to do with blood. Hmm? Coagulation, yeah, clotting, very good, platelets, okay? So that's part of our immune system as well, right? Not allowing things in, clotting, clotting the blood so that you don't get invaders into areas. Um, so yeah, a lot of different functions of these guys. We're gonna talk kind of vaguely about it because you could have a whole semester long class on just the immune system. So I won't do that to you, but I, I'm gonna keep it a little bit shorter than that, but we'll talk about some of the main players here. Now, we have two different branches of the immune system. We have the natural protective system, okay, or the innate system, and then we also have the specific system, okay? That's the one that kind of learns with our body. There are certain things that just innately we have that are part of the immune system, like mucous membranes, okay? So mucous membranes starting in our mouth, going all the way through and out the other end, also in our lungs, right? Mucous membranes in, in that area. Within that mucous membrane are different molecules and chemicals as well as different organisms that live there to bolster our immunity as well, okay? It grabs things, right? You think about, let's say you're at a campfire, right? And you breathe in a nice waft of that lovely smoke that follows you around the campfire. I don't know if that happens to anybody except for me. Yeah. The whole white rabbits thing, yeah. anybody? Yeah. yeah, okay, gotcha. So. So you breathe that in, what keeps all those particles from getting lodged and infecting into your lung tissue? Well, it's that kind of 
wet, moist layer of mucous membrane that grabs all of that and then flushes it back out when you cough. So that's one of the natural protective mechanisms of our immune system. Digestive acids, can anyone tell me how that might be protective for our bodies? What do acids do? They're corrosive, yes, they take things apart, right? They dissolve things, proteins, different, different things. So, so they can dissolve or kill, uh, get through the shell of some bacteria or viruses or that kind of thing, right? So having that really acidic pool that you drop your food into not only helps you digest, but it also prevents you from getting a, a big load of whatever was on the food that you were eating, right? It kind of is that first layer of, let's get rid of all this extra living stuff in here. Um, same with the pH of the blood or the urine, right? Different organisms are sensitive to environments that are more acidic or more basic. And so keeping your blood or pH or your urine pH at a certain level is not only protective, but if that is off, you can tell sometimes when you're having an infection too. So maintaining that's really, really important. Tears, okay, that's one that I often forget about. But you think about all that comes into contact with your eyes, right? Right in front of us, anything that hits our face. I mean, who hasn't had a kid ugh, right in their face, right? Just a nice sneeze right in the eyes. A lot of antibacterials, um, a lot of things living in those tears to keep you from getting sick. Now when we get into lymph nodes, we're getting into more specific immunity, okay? There's three big guys here that we talk about when we talk about specific immunity. Now these are the guys that can learn from your mistakes, okay? So you get an infection and your immune system sees that infection and it fights it and then it makes some of these cells to fight it if it ever sees it again. So you have like a reserve of cells that recognizes that right away and can mount an immune response immediately after you're exposed to, a, um, to any sort of organism. So when we talk about our immune system learning or building our immune system by coming into contact with different things, that's what we're talking about. This right here, the specific immune system is why I kind of like it when kids eat dirt, okay? because they come into contact with things and are able to build that basic immunity already. It's also part of what we get from breast milk, okay? From some of this already has learned, right? And our moms pass, us on, pass it on to us through the breast milk. So we have NK cells. Anybody hazard a guess as to what NK stands for? Think militaristic. Natural killer. Very good, natural killer cells, nice. Macrophages, macrophages are our Pac-Mans, okay? They're the ones that engulf things and break them apart inside and then put the pieces out and flush it out through your liver. And then we have T cells, there's a couple different kinds, okay? So you may have heard of T cells with specific cancers, maybe? That would be one way that you would think about that. Um, natural killer cells, we talk about that a lot. And then macrophages as well, because there's a couple different kinds of those, okay? Questions on any of this? Make sense? More than you would think, right? When you think of the immune system, sometimes we just think of this. We forget all of this stuff too. And all of this stuff needs to be kept healthy in order for us to have a healthy immune system, right? It's not just about vitamin C and keeping these guys healthy, right? You have to maintain all of these other things in order to have a really robust immune system. Yeah, make sense? Not if it makes sense. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that Pac-Man action, okay? It's called phagocytosis. Here's step one. Bacterium runs into a neutrophil or a macrophage, we'll say here, okay? What happens is the bacterium has little molecules on the outside of it that is recognized and bound by this white blood cell, okay? What happens next over here, is you can see the white blood cell will actually kind of hug <laughs> or engulf, okay, chomp on this bacterium, okay, taking it actually inside of itself, and then what it does is it breaks it down with these little granules, okay. Uh, an interesting part to note is that after this step, this guy gets broken down and these granules are released, okay. Now what do we know happens sometimes when our cells release granules into the outside of the cell? We, we have an inflammatory response. 
is what happens, okay? When we talk through a BIA, okay, if any of you guys are patients here, you'll know what I mean from a BIA. Sometimes we talk about intracellular water versus extracellular water. Extracellular water being inflammatory, right? One reason why cells will expel fluid like a white blood cell like this is to get rid of granules and that can cause inflammation. So when you come down with a flu or when this, this is happening a lot in your body, right? When this is happening a lot, what's going to go up on a BIA? Extracellular water, inflammation, right? Make sense? So that's one of the things that we look for when we're looking at looking for inflammation. We're saying, is this an immune, immune response, right? Is this an autoimmune response? Because that's the same thing that happens here. Okay, so phagocytosis, big part of our immune system, sp the specific type of immune system. Now, who are we talking about when we're talking about these invaders? Well, we've got a couple different categories here. Um, bacteria, okay, one of the more common ones. Viruses, also extremely common. Parasites, okay. Uh, who can name a parasite? What, what do you think of when you think of a parasite? I always think of the grossest one. Yes. Ugh. Gross. I had a science teacher in middle school who told us that if you had a tapeworm and you held a cheeseburger in front of your mouth open like this, the tapeworm would come up to eat the cheeseburger. Yeah. yeah. He was a mean man. I had... That was not okay. <laughs> Parasites. But... <laughs> You can have a lot of different things that are parasites. Sometimes they're big like tapeworms, sometimes they're very small, one-celled organisms. The definition of a parasite, can anybody tell me what that is? What, what makes something a parasite? It lives off of you. Correct, yeah, it lives off of you. Okay, it's taking from you or from whatever host organism. It's not giving anything back. There are, there are some organisms that give back to us, right? Our healthy bacteria that live on our skin and in our gut. They're actually beneficial to us. They're not parasites, even though they live off of some of the byproducts that we create. Okay, so when we talk about parasites or bacteria, we're talking about specific ones, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then fungi or yeasts, right? Anybody heard of somebody having a yeast infre infection, right? That can happen a lot of different, different ways, different areas on our skin, in our mucous membranes, in our mouths, right? So those can also be invaders or infectors of our body. So again, with the, uh, with the militaristic terminology. Uh, anybody recognize this guy from the news? Ebola virus. Okay, that's what he looks like. This is a cluster of bacteria. And then we have two different viruses here that we're going to mention, I think. Rhinovirus here would be the cold virus. And then the flu virus, I think that's influenza A. Can you read that? I can't from this angle. So a couple different types here to demonstrate what they might look like under a microscope with some staining. I think they're kind of pretty. Isn't that weird? Okay, two other terms that I want you to become familiar with. One is pathogenicity, and the second is virul virulence. That's a hard one to say, virulence. Uh, they are related to each other. Pathogenicity is the ability to cause disease. Really, really important to know that most bacteria are not pathogenic. They don't harm us, okay? They live together with us. They're balanced. They actually help us. They make different things for our bodies that we need. They break down things for us, okay? They keep us from getting bad bacteria, right? So when we talk about a bacteria, you know, they get a bad rap, but most bacteria are not pathogenic especially for a healthy host, okay? You'll hear about opportunistic bacteria, where if the host is weakened in some way already, bacteria that normally are not pathogenic will become pathogenic, okay? So an oppor opportunity, opportunistic, right? Makes sense? So we as a host, if we've got that whole lovely list of bacteria right, then those opportunistic infections aren't gonna bother us because they're not gonna be pathogenic to us. Now, the degree to which they are pathogenic is called virulence, okay? So let's say you have a pathogenetic organism, bacteria, um, how sick it can make you or how easy it is to make you sick is the virulence. So we've got MRSA. Anybody familiar with MRSA? 
Okay? So MRSA is more virulent than Staph aureus okay? because it's resistant to methicillin. So it's worse. It's a badder bug. It's stronger. It can fight off different antibiotics easier. Okay, so that's the difference between pathogenicity and virulence. Make sense? Okay. I'm going to talk, well, Dr. Stacy and I are going to talk about viruses, mostly. Um, because bacteria is a little bit uh, a different topic, we wanted to cover the things that are more common for us this time of year, which are viruses. Um, viruses are considered an infectious particle. It's, viruses are not alive. That is a weird thing to think about. Um, but they, they don't meet one of the criteria of a living thing. Anybody can tell me what that is? In order to be alive, you must be able to reproduce, reproduce independently. Yeah, viruses cannot do that. They need a host cell. They need our cells or an animal cell or a different kind of cell in order to reproduce, okay? So that makes them not alive which is weird because they're kind of alive but not quite alive. So they're infectious particles, okay? And with, that means that we treat them differently. It means that um, certain kind of things to kill them doesn't work, right? They're harder to kill because you have to kill your own cells in order to kill them. You can't just interrupt the cycle by harming the bacteria. You have to actually harm some of your own cells somehow in order to get rid of a virus, okay? It makes it harder. That's why you have these, these viruses that kind of go on rampages through areas, whether they're highly virulent or not, because they're hard to get under control. The body's immune system really is the only thing that can do it. And we can support that, but, the, but we can't fight it as well as we can fight like a bacteria. Bacterial, bacterial um, plagues, let's say, are more a thing of the past when we didn't have antibiotics. Hopefully they will not be a thing of the future as we lose a lot of our antibiotic efficiency, but really the big deal is viruses because of this reason. Okay? They need that host cell in order to replicate. And there's a cycle here showing first you have a virus, okay? it attaches to the cell, comes in, attaches, here's our, here's our real cell, our cell. The virus is here and the, the virus's DNA is right here. Okay. The virus injects the DNA, its own DNA, into the cell, and the cell actually makes more DNA for the virus. It tricks our cells into making the wrong DNA. And then once all these viruses are happily formed within our cell, the, they are multiplied and they bust out of the cell, killing the cell, okay, and creating more viruses. So you see how the spread is just exponential right of a virus and really the only place to stop this is here to stop this from happening okay or if you can somehow figure out to get a cell not to inject its dna into your or a virus to inject its dna into your cell good luck with that in fact we actually use viruses sometimes to inject specific dna that we want into our own cells so they'll use what's called a viral vector, okay, it's pretty new science, but they'll use a virus and they'll put a specific DNA that they want into it. Let's say you have a deficiency in uh, a genetic deficiency of one kind where you don't make a specific enzyme or something to break down different proteins. Sometimes people are born with these problems. And so what they are trying to do is inject this DNA into the cell, replicate it so that you actually do have the DNA that you need which is kind of fascinating. So we're starting to use viruses, but uh, the moral of the story is this is how it spreads. Make sense? Good. So types of viral infections that we're looking at. Loads of different ones, loads, okay? Upper respiratory tract infections, colds, okay? That's your rhinovirus, Dr. Stacy's gonna cover that. We have influenza or the flu. So influenza A, B, C, blah, blah, blah. Gastroenteritis, which are different, okay, and we're going to talk about that next. Uh, hepatitis A, what, what is harmed in hepatitis by that virus? Liver. What is that? Yeah, liver, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. A, A through C, Ebola. That should say 
polio, <laughs> uh, mumps, chicken pox, right? We're familiar with some of these viruses, right? They're part of our, uh, part of our lives. And, and a lot of them are not like Ebola, right? This is Ebola and hepatitis, they're kind of the outliers here. These guys are all self-limiting for the most part, okay? Meaning that your body can take care of it on its own with a little bit of support if your host is healthy. Question, will antibiotics help you with any of these viral infections? What do you think? What do antibiotics do? Kill bacteria. They don't really do anything for viruses, sorry. And that's why we're trying to back off on all the antibiotics we're prescribing for things like ear infections, right? Like over 75% of ear infections are not bacterial, they're viral. So giving an antibiotic really isn't gonna do you any good, okay? That kind of stuff. So when we talk about antibiotics, uh, again, sometimes they get a bad rap, but it's because we're using them for these kinds of things, which is not correct, actually. And we're starting to learn that when you use an antibiotic with the influenza, you're making a stronger influenza. It doesn't care about the antibiotic, okay? And you're creating bacteria that are resistant to that antibiotic. Big problem. So for these things, what, what do we need to do instead of antibiotics? Well, I'm gonna hopefully impress that upon you. So the flu. Common misconception is that the flu and gastroenteritis are the same, okay? When some people say the flu, they think these symptoms, vomiting, diarrhea, cramping, okay? The stomach flu is sometimes how they say it. That's these bugs, norovirus, adenovirus, rotavirus. Technically, not the flu. They're not influenza, that's where it comes from. Influenza is fever, chills, body aches, you're in bed, you're exhausted. There might be some, some other symptoms along with it. Headaches is a big one. Um, any others that I'm forgetting? Anybody think of any other symptoms of the actual influenza? That kind of covers it. So difference there, right? Usually not a whole lot of gut issues with the actual flu, okay? So very different creatures. Um, and we're gonna kind of stick with talking about the actual influenza, because it's more common. This is, I mean, food poisoning really, when you get down to it, gastroenteritis. It comes from something bad that you ate or drank or put on your body, right? We're, we're talking about Moctezuma's revenge. When we're talking about gastroenteritis, yeah? Or going to a, on a cruise ship and getting, getting one of these guys. Um, but the flu, much more common. So what do we do for the flu? Well, make sure your immune system is strong, okay? Make sure that you have good digestive acids. Make sure that your mucous membranes are healthy, right? Those kind of things. Make sure that you have trained your specific immune system, right? That you've gotten out there. You've eaten some dirt, okay? I know it sounds crazy, but really it does. It's amazing what it can do for your immune system. Uh, hydration is a big deal with the flu. Um, staying well hydrated. We like to suggest rice water or vegetable broths. Very easy for your body to absorb. And they also have some electrolytes and some other things in them that um, water doesn't just have without the sugars, right? The Pedialytes of our, of our world. We, we don't love to use that because of the sugar content. Um, but these guys, you get good nutrients as well. We talk about vitamin C. That's a kind of common one for the immune system. We think about that. Now we use one called ultra-potent C. Um, it has some studies behind it that are very compelling. One of which is when you take a different form of vitamin C, a very common form of vitamin C, what happens is your immune system function actually decreases for a few hours. And then it comes back up and goes up like this, okay? With ultra-potent C, it's been demonstrated that there is not a dip. Okay, it's a different style or a different formulation of vitamin C. So it just goes straight up, right? So if you come down with something, you feel like, oof, I feel like something's coming on. You don't want three hours of a dip in your immune system, right? You want to actually just cruise it on right up. 
So that's what ultrapotent C does for us. We really like this one for that. Um, mycofarin's another one. Mycofarin is our blend of Chinese mushrooms. This is a more acute care thing, in my opinion. I'll use it more for um, a shorter per type, time period. I don't really use this one uh, prophylactically or as prevention on its own. It's very, very strong. It's like aggressive treatment, but it's very gentle on your body because it's food. So mushrooms are food, our bodies like food. It just happens to be medicinal food, okay? Very, very helpful for the flu. Uh, Oscillococcinum, this is a homeopathic remedy that we really, really like. Helps bring down fevers, right, Doc? Yeah, good for fevers. Um, really good for that achy sort of feel, and it's nicely dosed out for you. Very tolerated by children as well. Both of these guys are. Well, if you get them to plug their nose. <laughs> The mycofarin doesn't taste great. Although I know some kids who love it, like they'll beg for it, which is, blows my mind. So oscillococcinum, that's our homeopathic. Now when I talk about prevention for the flu, this is the guy that I go for. I think he is the biggest bang for your buck because you get three things out of him, okay? You get ultrapotent C, zinc, which is really, really big deal for our immune system, and you get this mushroom extract. Okay, plus a couple other things. I think there's some selenium in there. Um, but Immucor is really what I love to use for preventative for any of this immune assault that we're going through at this time of year. Tends to be the, the one that I like the best. Not, not so much for treatment if you already have something, but um, really, really nice for just making sure you don't get anything. I'm gonna let Dr. Stacy hop up here. You good? Mm -hmm. Okay, and we'll get going on the cold since we're kind of shifting that way anyway. Yep. All right. Thank you, Dr. Kate. Yeah, my uh, pleasure. I'm glad that I ate dirt when I was little. <laughs> Mom let me make a lot of mud pies, so it was always good for me. Um, so basically, uh, as we as we work through, there are, you're going to see a lot of crossovers. Um, we chose a lot of different treatment plans, and you're going to see the Dr. Denbors for Ebola come cross with common cold, which also will cross with the flu. So a lot of the symptoms will intermesh. A lot of times when you have a virus, it will transform itself and act as an ILR virus. That's why a lot of people with the flu will start out where, oh, I just feel achy, they'll get diarrhea or vomiting, and then maybe they'll end up with a cold when it's all done. So it could just transform itself, especially as the host is healing. So you just never know where you're going from. Um, with the common cold, it's basically, as Dr. Kate had said, mostly viral. You're not going to see many of these become bacterial or fungal. Um, traditionally, if they do that, it's because they've been there a long time, longer than about 10 days is when the, most studies say that it starts to transform. Traditionally, this will commonly affect the nose. Um, I also end up going into the respiratory tract because it's mucus. A lot of mucus that affects the nose will affect the lungs. Coughing, sneezing, fever sore throat, runny nose, those are your basic symptoms. So these are pretty, seem to be pretty straightforward. Um, otherwise known as the common cold gets a lot of names. <laughs> Nasopharyngitis, rhinopharyngitis, acute coryza, and head cold are many of the things if you want to get real technical, you can walk and say, I have rhinopharyngitis today. <laughs> you really stun your workers with that one. And, and everybody's like, wow, that sounds infectious. I am, stay away. <laughs> You know, just kind of those good things and you keep everybody away from you. Interesting fact about the common cold. Th this is really, it's found at temps of 91, 95 degrees. That's the temperature of the internal part of your nose. Hmm, imagine that, that's why it ends up in the nose. Transmission, uh, this, it, oops, sorry. That's supposed to say adheres within 15 minutes of contact. Sorry, I messed up the minutes there. Um, Basically, this is transmitted by many different things. Obviously, we all know coughing or sneezing. We're going to get more likely. Spread that out respiratory for everybody. Contaminated surfaces, so, so you cover your mouth and then touch something. That can live there for up to three hours. So, wow, that's a little different as you think about it. Um, and, and at that three hours point, it doesn't have a host, it dies. So. Direct person to person, that's also the other thing is, you know, you usually we cough on somebody else, it goes in our mucous membranes, our lacrimal ducts in our eyes, either our nose or in our mouth, or even us touching a surface and then wiping our face, because how many of us touch our face throughout the day? Ladies, we're always checking our makeup, we're always touching our face. It tends to be that's where we're going to get it, is in it to our mucous membranes. So really, this does not mean there's more need for bleach or antibacterial wipes. 
okay? Really a, a nice basic general soap that doesn't have to be antibacterial. Really works nice to clean things up. Um, some of what has gone on in our world is we've tried to make things too clean and we've created more and more sicknesses because your immune system never gets the chance to mature. Kiddos need to be involved with dirt. They need to be involved with touching things and getting things dirty because really that's what builds their immune system. When we take all that away and we want to, oh no, no, you can't have that off the floor, you're not allowing that immune system to mature. So it is important, but also we want to keep things clean. So the other thing, common colds. Symptoms usually appear, and this is the, the stinky part because really you just don't know. <laughs> they appear two days after you've had contact with somebody. So you could have contact, not have a clue that you touched something that somebody else touched that had the cold, and there you go, you got the cold, and that's what a lot of people are like, I don't know where I got this. It's all right, probably nobody does, except obviously the universe. Um, but muscle aches, weakness, fatigue, malaise, headache, and loss of appetite are other symptoms that tend to go along with this. Now, this is odd because, you know, they always say, starve a fever, feed a, feed a cold. Can you feed a cold when you're not hungry? So, yeah, sometimes that doesn't work. Headaches tend to come from overtoxins within the viruses trying to break down, so we're not, our liver's not working, so that's why this goes back to what Dr. Kate said. Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. If we stay hydrated, a lot of times we can prevent viruses from attaching to our system because your body can flush them out before they actually attach. Now, I chose, this is a, a different route than uh, what doc, Dr. Kate had said. It's a little different than from what Dr. Denbor had said. Could I have used mycofarin with a common cold? Absolutely. But most of the time, what you're trying to attack is that chronic runny nose. Now, the one big thing that I didn't put on here is essential defense, which is absolutely wonderful, but only works within the first 24 hours. So if you start to notice, hey, I've got nasal drainage, get on your essential defense. It's two tablets every 30 minutes. It'll dry you up. It'll help. It's amazing. Um, but after that 24 hours, that's not where it works anymore. So then you kind of move into some of these other things. I chose different things as well, like the Reboost. Um, this is a sore throat spray. This one's great because it's homeopathic. I absolutely love the um, Sinusin because this is also a uh, nasal spray, homeopathic. So these are both great for kids and adults. Um, and, and in relation to the humidity in the house, because yes, that is one of the reasons that we tend to get sicknesses in the winter over the summers because we tend to create that dryness, which then creates our mucous membranes to not be moist and help to flush out the toxins. So even like a uh, neti pot, nasal flushes, those kind of things actually help to clean bacteria out of the nose, especially in the winter. Reboost is, is known, I'm sorry, sinusin is known to actually moisten those mucous membranes in our nose. By moistening them, it helps to flush out the bacteria. Histoag Plus being the, at the top of my list, uh, this is more of a nettle, stinging nettle extract. Uh, stinging nettles are mucolytic. So um, the easiest way is everybody knows mucosin. Think about mucosin. This acts very similar, um, but naturally allows the immune system build at the same time it's dropping the mucus amount. So it helps your body absorb the mucus instead of chronically having to cough it out or blow your nose. Because one of the biggest things with common cold was everybody complained about the cracks and the sores around our nose from blowing it. Um, so that's, that, this is one thing that will help the body naturally build itself. Bronchicin, I absolutely love bronchicin. This is a herbal formula by, um, this one is A.J. Vogel, isn't it? Yes, A.J. Vogel. And I wrote uh, actually some notes of the ingredients of Bronchicin because it's one of those, it's like, holy cow. They have fresh ivy, thyme, licorice, and eucalyptus in there. So basically with all of these, ivy is known as a natural cough remedy or expectorant. So it'll ex get rid of the mucus and stop the coughing. Thyme is an antibacterial, so it does cover bacterial if it is a bacterial cold. Licorice, the beautiful thing about licorice, licorice is used for so many things. It soothes mucous membranes and coughs. It's antimicrobial, antiviral, and activates those macrophages. So it's going to activate your Pac-Men for you. And then eucalyptus, which relieves cough and upper respiratory inflammation. And it's an antihistamine, which is just wonderful. So bronchosin has a lot of bang within it. The nice thing is kids will take this as well. It is liquid. It's kind of like mycofarin. Some people love it, but I think it's bitter. I did not grow up on herbs, so for me, not having that, that bitter is really, really potent in my mouth. But kiddos that start out at young don't have a problem, do they? 
no issues. They don't even notice. They're like, oh, yeah, no big deal. So that's, I, I thought, wow, bronchocin's got a lot of things in it and you don't really think about all of those herb components that are really nutrient for the body. Now, nasanol, um, this is another herbal component. And, and nasanol basically is just for the chronic runny nose. So you can use either the Histoag Plus or the nasanol. I find one person may not work as well with Histoag Plus, but they'll do great with nasanol. So it, it's more of the uniqueness of the individual that we're always striving to find what works for them. So uh, the other thing that I left off this list, and I apologize, is um, echinacea. You can never go wrong with echinacea with a cold, um, especially if you have a sore throat because of the chronic mucus drainage, gargling and swallowing with echinacea. But echinacea has so much research out there on the common cold. The funny thing is, if you research common cold in ascorbic acid or vitamin C, you're going to see a ton of the research says, oh, it doesn't work. Vitamin C does not prevent a cold. It doesn't help relieve the symptoms of a cold. And some of that research is altered because they're actually using synthetic vitamin C. Synthetic vitamin C is very tough to build up in the body. Yes, it, it does store where it needs to be in the liver, but it is water soluble, so it's going to flush out very quickly. So obviously, it's helping the liver detoxify. Um, the ultrapotency being more of a chelated form, which allows the vitamin C to stay in the body. It's a fat soluble vitamin C. I chose the 500 C here. Um, 500 C has the methoxyflavone is what it's called, but it's basically a bioflavonoid complex. And your fruits, like say, take kiwi, for example, high vitamin C, but it also has a lot of bioflavonoids in it. That's what allows that vitamin C to really infiltrate the, the muscle cells, the liver, the mucous membranes, and that's what gets it to where it needs to be to boost the immune system. The, also, the, the methoxyflavin, the 500 C methoxyflavin, is known to strengthen those of us that struggle with lung problems. So if you're likely to get sick and it's going to attack your lungs, this is the vitamin C that has been recommended because it strengthens those lung tissues. It's also great for capillaries. As you look at the bioflavonoid complex with the vitamin C, it'll strengthen capillaries. So anybody that bruises easily and you don't notice why you're bruising, you just have bruises show up, this is one of the things that will support that. So it strengthens tissues along with it. So, and you can, you don't, it just as Dr. Denbor had recommended on Facebook, um, doing three ultra potency four or five times a day um, will actually kick out a cold at the same time. You can use either vitamin C's, um, but if you're somebody that's more prone to bruising or weeping gums where your gums bleed when you brush them, you may need this vitamin C instead because it will strengthen the capillaries and help your body heal faster. So depends on your uniqueness. Does that make sense? All right, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Denbor to talk a little bit about Ebola. Now he's going to scare you. <laughs> it fascinates me to no end. I can just study this every day and never get tired of it. This, uh, some of these things, um, like for example, bronchocin, uh, it, it's just really nice to, to see it evolve from folk medicine where it was just 30, 40 years ago, uh, same with the Kinoforce, to where it's at today, German e-commission stamp of approval, meaning it's got five years of clinical research behind it. It's been published, we know how it works, why it works, possible side effects, interactions with meds, all those things, none, by the way. Um, and uh, so, so science has really arrived to uh, verify what uh, the ancients have known for a long time. And uh, in a lot of cases, these things are more effective than, um, than pharmaceuticals, like Histoag Plus, for instance. Uh, I've seen some very nasty pneumonias, bacterial pneumonias, dissipate in three to four days just with Histoag because it stabilizes the histamine response. It works as an expectorant, like Dr. Stacy said. Um, uh, absolutely love seeing the results that we're getting. Um, but let's, let's jump to Ebola. It's, it's hit the news and um, there's a lot, it's, it's, it's obviously really taken the press by a storm. It's, the, it's this incredible bug, uh, a super bug. It's a hemorrhagic fever kind of a bug. Uh, in, in other words, it causes severe hemorrhaging and completely um, uh, just involves the entire body. It just is like a tsunami wave going over the body. But there's so much misconception with this. Uh, it was first discovered uh, in um, 
uh, Africa in the uh, mid 1970s. Uh, in that, by 1976, uh, we noticed that uh, there was this bug uh, that was just uh, uh, inflicting entire villages with a death rate of between 40 and 95 percent, uh, depending on which strain was going around. And um, I've, I've heard some interviews. Uh, on the original researchers and on the original research and comparing to, to today and this bug is constantly evolving just when we think we got it figured out boom it changes reminds me a little bit of the flu bug doesn't it this is why we can't really get a good vaccine going for even the flu um, by the way the flu vaccine last year was uh, if you had a flu vaccine you're 1.5 percent less likely to get the flu 1.5%. Um, let's. The amount of side effects from this flu vaccine is scary. Uh, I know I'm off on a little different tangent and rant right now, but I think it's a worthwhile thing. And uh, not that long ago, in one of our major prestigious medical journals from England, it was noted that with kids getting the flu vaccine, the amount of seizure activity went up so dramatically that uh, they have basically outlawed it now. One out of 120 kids will develop a seizure disorder with the flu vaccine. I find that astonishing. I says, well, how can we possibly do this over here? That's just, I, can, I don't understand it. But then I remembered, oh yeah, we're kind of used to this kind of stuff. We don't even blink an eye with, say, autistic spectrum disorder, where it used to be 1 in 22,000, and within the last 20 years now has moved to 1 in 64. Yeah, it's a bit of a problem, but you see a very lazy response to this. This is an economic disaster as well as a human disaster, isn't it? Um, so we're kind of used to these things. Um, a little bit like pain, the latest statistic from last year on pain pills just came out. It, killed 16,200 and some Americans. Just pain pills used properly. I'm thinking that is an absolutely astonishing figure. What if echinacea killed 100 people? What do you think happen would happen? Right? 16,200 people. And yet we just take that. It's normal. It's not. These are highly abnormal things. Back to Ebola. Um, so what we do know is that its infectious rate is actually not terribly high. It's a little bit like the common cold and flu. However, when you do catch it, it can be disastrous. And that's why we get so much uh, attention to this bug. And also, I have this sneaking suspicion that we don't quite know how it gets spread. It's, I'm seeing these healthcare workers coming back and they've been wearing full hazmat. In other words, you've, you've seen the pictures, right? The, the full gear, and yet they're getting Ebola. How does that work? And then for a while the CDC was saying, well, it only works with direct contact, especially when a patient's near death. And then we got the word, well, perhaps, um, perhaps uh, we can spread it through the air because when you sneeze, these droplets travel and this bug can live for four to five days. I'm thinking, okay, sneeze onto a surface, can live there four or five days. Hmm, maybe this thing is a little more catchy. People just aren't quite giving us all the news. Now the ne recent news uh, came out just a week ago that after you've been cured of Ebola, in other words, it has gone away totally, no symptoms, it is still present in some of your fluids for up to three months afterwards. Yeah, we're talking, for example, in semen. Three months later, after you've had it, it is still present. So there's so much we don't know about this bug. And here we are uh, listening to our CDC, the government, and the so-called experts proclaiming all these black and white things. You know what? We don't know any of that. We know maybe 5% of this bug, as we do about the flu, as we do about the common cold. These things are constantly evolving, outsmarting us, and what... I have, where I get this emperor has no clothes saying, I don't know if you know the fable from China, the emperor has no clothes, it's basically where the emperor was wearing less and less and less and all his, his uh, uh, advisors around him uh, were afraid to 
uh, say anything uh, and say, oh, that's beautiful, that's beautiful. And to, okay, it's beautiful. And finally, he was wearing no clothes at all. And everybody was saying, well, I'm probably not seeing what everybody else is seeing, but yeah, that's beautiful. And then eventually some little child said, but the emperor has no clothes. And then everybody realized that truly he had no clothes. And the CDC and the government have been exposed that way. Um, uh, I, I was listening to an interview by one of our major CDC directors and they were interviewing him about Ebola and what do we do? What do we do to prevent Ebola? Well, they went into the normal things like isolation, figuring out the right to mode of transmission and that's all good. Obviously you have to do damage control. He says, but our primary defense right now is to get the flu shot. This is from the very top level. This, this was given when Ebola first came out and I'm going, did I hear that right? The flu shot for Ebola. And they questioned him, well, what would that do for Ebola? Well, um, he went on to another topic. But it seems like any excuse that we can get to push the flu shot, we will use shamelessly. Obviously the flu shot, I don't even have to cover that topic, but I thought the emperor has no clothes. It's just been exposed right there. We don't know how to truly take care of our people. All we are good at right now, sadly, is disease management. And yes, disease management is pretty important. If you have a heart attack right now, disease management is pretty good. Yeah, I like it. I like it better than echinacea for a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, th th does that make sense? But truly, doesn't it make sense to go upstream like we do in functional medicine and go to the top and maybe try to work on preventing the heart attack in the first place? Or let's work on our immune system because ultimately the immune system is what's really going to defeat this bug. Because once you have that bug in your crisis mode, we are into disease management. Support with fluids, right? And just basically try to support the patient as the patient fights off this deadly bug. We don't have any drugs that work for this. We don't, even Tamiflu for instance, right? The anti-flu vaccine or uh, drug that's out there, it really doesn't work. At best, when you catch it before symptoms and you take Tamiflu, you're shortening the flu by 12 hours. That's a best case scenario amidst multiple side effects. That's what we have for flu. For Ebola, we have nothing. We have a lot of theoretical things, but we do have our immune system. And our immune system is incredibly smart. And we just got some new research out that shows that the majority of people who caught this bug actually just show minor flu symptoms, if that. A little bit tired, fighting things off, and it never goes anywhere. Ebola. So the immune system recognized this danger and started putting borders around it until finally it went away. Ebola is deadly only when it gets to a certain level, yeah? And it starts overwhelming the body. At that point, our defenses have been breached and that's when it becomes a life or death situation. We're talking an incredible amount of viral particles at this point. And every, the body's thrown everything it can at it, but obviously there is something missing in the immune system somehow. And it could be as simple as sleep deprivation. One hour lost sleep equals 30% less immunity the next day. It could be a nutritional deficiency. I, we, we, we can go on and on and on about that. So the best defense, the best medicine is us, and what was created inside of us, our immune system. Incredibly intelligent, incredibly smart, and let's take care of that. And we'll go through some steps right away on how to do that. But this whole Ebola thing has really, really shown the ineffectiveness of our health care in truly providing health to our nation. Instead, disease management is all we're doing and look at us as a country. So the basics for the immune system to review what we've covered today. The immune system is really impacted by many things. This is a somewhat familiar version to you. This is the web. I decided to just re, redo it somewhat. The nervous system. Well, how does that involve 
the immune system. If we can get the, immune, the nervous system working better, say through an adjustment, where things are starting to hum, interference is taken away. We know that that increases phagocytic activity, right? What Dr. talked about, that Pac-Man, the golfing thing. It increases it almost immediately. So our first line of response within our blood is enhanced greatly. This is why Medicare studies have shown twice now, large studies, that those that get regular adjustments have 70% fewer colds and flus during the season. By the way, they studied hospitalizations also and about of a decrease of about 59% there. I think astonishing figures. And that's just by modulating the nervous system. So if something is off nervous system wise, your immune system will be depressed greatly. The gut. The gut is a huge component of the immune system, right? It affects it by 70 to 80 percent. We think the gut is 70 to 80 percent of the immune system. That is big. Taking care of the gut will take care of the immune system. The gut is under incredible assault in the Western society. And I look at navigating our food system as, as taking a boat through the ocean with a whole bunch of reefs all around me. Truly, when I go to a restaurant or I go to the grocery store, I'm having to dodge bullets everywhere. They're out to get me, these reefs, right? So anything in the package are little packages of death. Just be extreme in your, in your, in your viewpoint, right? Uh, sugar is your new poison. And uh, those uh, food manufacturers are out to get you. Let's be paranoid about this. So just eat things that look like they grew. Eat mostly plants. Be well hydrated. Eat in a peaceful environment. Take care of the good bacteria. This is why probiotics are so important here at DBC. It's a big component of gut health because we have 10 times as many bugs as we have cells. Yeah, gut, very important. The psyche is critical as well. We know that if a, if a person gets bad news, like uh, death of a loved one, immediately their immune system crashes by 60% within minutes. Okay, the psyche is really important. Hygiene, yes, we see it all over the place. Wash, wash, wash. However, don't overwash because this microbiome, this bacteria that protects us, is not only in the gut, but it's on the skin as well. It's a very important layer. And we often ignore it, and we don't talk about it enough, frankly. So these antibacterial soaps might be hurting us more than, than helping us. Be careful of those, because they will disrupt the microbiome on the skin. And the skin is one of our first line of defenses, isn't it? So when you wash, focus on those hands. Just there's, especially when out in public, um, I just read this wonderful report on, um, on uh, the trays in the uh, airplanes that 70% of them have Staph aureus on them because they get uh, clean only once every 22 days on average. And I'm going, ooh, um, yes, not good. <laughs> um, um, on that appetizing uh, uh, point, we'll go to the next one, sleep. Um, sleep is, uh, I just mentioned already, uh, you decrease it by an hour and you got 30% less immunity. We need more sleep in the winter, folks, 45 minutes more. Okay, then as compared to summer, it has to do with the, bi the biorhythm of light. Um, so sleep is huge. Hormones. So with hormones, we think estrogen, testosterone, all that. Of course, when hormones are disrupted, it will affect sleep, right? It will affect a lot of, yes, your immune system. But an important one is your adrenals, cortisol especially. When cortisol is chronically elevated due to stress, it has a huge depressing effect on your immune system. Your sugar regulation goes off and that affects the immune system. It is one of our first lines of defense to kick the immune system in. Just like the nervous system is, hormones are critical. Stress in life, I know we can't always get rid of stress, but we can certainly change how we process it. Yes, we have all kinds of tools available. That's not the subject of today's, of today's seminar, but be aware of that. Our respiratory system, um, this, th this one is a little harder to take care of. There's a couple of basics though. Make sure your, your humidity is around 35 to 40 
percent or so in your house. That preserves your mucous membranes. When they dry out, they crack a little bit. Those are wonderful avenues for viruses and bacteria to get in. Yeah? So respiratory system, take care of it that way. Another one is a really cool one. And this is research from Denmark. It is new. And that is they, they have figured out the bugs that live in the respiratory tract. We're talking nose, sinuses, throat, as well as lungs. They have a completely different microbiome or bacteria compared to the gut or skin. So they thought, hmm, I wonder if we put that, that as a probiotic into uh, a capsule and have patients take it. What would happen? Some wonderful things happen. Things like strep can actually be treated by this. Things like sinus infections dissipate quickly. As a preventative, it shows very significant decrease in cold and flu risk. Some of the studies suggested a 70% decrease. It's called Ultraflora Immune Booster. I'm very impressed, as are the doctors, by how well this works. We've seen sore throats dissipate with this so quick. Ultra and Flora Immune Booster, we use it as a preventative also, only one a day. That's all it takes. And yes, nutrition. Boy, we can sabotage our immune system big time with eating the wrong foods. Did you know the sugar that's in one pop will depress your immune system by about 30% for a day and a half? So the first, worst thing that you can do if you're fighting something is drink a pop. You pretty much guaranteed that you're going to get it. Yeah? So stay away from those sugars. Remember, that's poison. And let's go to the leafy greens, which feeds our gut, and the gut is our immune system. And here comes the last but not least, and that is exercise. And exercise is very immune modulating. It promotes good immunity to a point. If I told you to go for a 10 mile run tonight, you know you might be sick tomorrow, right? Because you just overstressed your body. So know your limits, know where you're at and try to build it up from there. If you're out of shape, don't go crazy and do CrossFit. It will make you ill. Yeah, you work up to these things. So that's really important because we don't want to overstress the, uh, the, the body. So some of the checklists, get your sleep, get outside air and exercise. Yes, even in the winter, unless you're in extreme conditions, because the outside airs helps us acclimate to the winter time, right? Otherwise you go from just comfortable in here to, oh, it's freezing out there, you know, and I'm, you know, as a European, uh, it's, I was, I was kind of poking fun at Americans for this, because here comes winter and here's your classic American walking outside. <laughs> and it's so different because in the Netherlands people it's raining they're just walking normal like this whatever and I think the reason is we are forced over there to be outside all the time because we're on our bicycles and walking everywhere you don't really use cars there because uh, good luck finding parking and because of that you just acclimate and you accept what's there and we are always fighting our weather don't fight it. Be part of it. It's more fun. It's more, you might actually start liking winter. Yeah, embracing winter. So, anywho. Um, so, the outside air also includes outside light. There's something about the light, not just hitting our eyes, but our skin as well, that is immune stimulating. We don't know how that works, but we know it works. It's an observational study. Prayerful meditation, this takes care of the psyche. The psyche is part of their immune system. So when you go for a walk, you can have prayerful meditation or do deep breathing exercises where you're taking a breath in four seconds and seven seconds out reduces the cortisol levels. And yes, you can have prayerful contemplation. At the same time, it does amazing things. Food we covered, the adjustments we covered, nutraceuticals, there's a few key ones that were mentioned. One of them is the ultra flora immune health, right? Essential defense, Dr. Stacy mentioned that you take two every hour, the first 24 hours. The chances are you will not need to do anything else. It works that well. Almost every time, if you are fighting something, you just feel that feeling, you're a little sore throat, a little bit shivery type of thing, and you take essential defense two every half hour, you will not catch that bug. 
So that is an important part of your arsenal. Ultrapotent C is the fat soluble vitamin C that is so much more effective, doesn't cause that decrease in overall uh, immunity, which is that little crack in the door that the bugs need, right? If you take ascorbic acid only, you're going to uh, actually enhance your chances of getting sick. Ultrapotent C is why we recommend it. And echinophores, this is the echinacea. This is ironic because it comes from Switzerland. And you know what? This is a Native American plant. This is Native American. And the Swiss, uh, as well as Germans, copied it from the Native Americans in the 17th century, cultivated it, brought it back to Europe. Now they're importing it to us. Echinophores, if you look at the quality control of what they do in Europe, it is so different in here because you can get echinacea in all kinds of titrations and you know what it is dead and you don't even know if you're getting the active part of the plant but here they are only allowed to use certain parts of the root and flower and a couple of key components of the leaf it can only be harvested when it's flowering it can has to be processed within 24 hours it has to be all organic right there's all these laws in place so that when you buy a force you're getting something that actually works we gargle with it, we uh, take it internally, and the way it works, it increases phagocytic activity as well as kill bugs on contact. And a really good multiple, the Phyto Multi, in my opinion, um, is um, by far the best that's out there because it is plant-based, has clinical trials behind it, its antioxidant value is equal to about 20 cups of blueberries per vitamin and has all the protective elements in it for today's society. So it helps you detoxify plastics, protects eyes, uh, upregulates detoxification, all, all kinds of neat things. Um, it's a very uh, affordable um, and uh, again, one of the best multiples that's out there. For prevention, to recap that, the ultraflora immune health, Vitamin D, which wasn't mentioned, but how much can we do in one session, right? We're already going over. But vitamin D, I've mentioned enough, so I'm going to trust that you, you know it's, it's a phenomenal activity. Immucor was that mycoferrin in tablet form, right, that with some extra vitamin C attitude. Immucor uh, is, is probably one of the best flu preventers and cold preventers out there, along with ultrapotency and the uh, phytomulti, and I take two of those per day, every day. If for those of you wondering about dosing vitamin D in kids, for every 25 pounds, I do 1,000. So a 50 pound kid, I give 2,000. If they happen to be somewhat low and they have trouble with the immune system, I sneak in an extra 1,000. So instead of 2,000, then I would just go up to three. It's very, very difficult to overdose on vitamin D. Yeah. Gender specific weight loss. Had this epiphany. Paging through some diet books that had just been published, of course on the bestseller list. I thought to myself, you know, wh wh how is this different from DBC? And then I thought, you know, I've always assumed that this is normal, but I guess it's not because nobody mentions it. But what I do for males and what the doctors do for males, we don't do for females and vice versa. It is very gender and age specific. What works for me is not going to work for a woman who's going through menopause. Wouldn't you agree? So we're going to do a seminar outlining those differences and what the different protocols look like for reaching optimum weight. It's a fun one. It's one that uh, it's so commonsensical, I always assume that everybody should, would be doing that, but when you look at these books, it is never ever mentioned that maybe males and females are a bit different. So we're going to be, uh, we're going to be digging into that. If you want to be there, sign up early because this is uh, one that always uh, is a bit of a, a, a gangbuster or blockbuster, whatever the word is, uh, because uh, something about weight loss that seems to be popular, I don't know what it is. So. We're gonna, we're gonna work on that one. Fed up. Yes, Fed Up is a great movie, by the way. I, uh, it's, it's good to see some of our colleagues in it being uh, interviewed uh, and showing some of their wisdom. So, any questions regarding this topic?